my title of the talk, of course, is uh, Sustainable Feeds and how we're <clears throat> moving towards them through the collective efforts of researchers and industries. And as I mentioned in my introduction, I want to just briefly cover some of the trends that have occurred over the last several decades. Um, one of the most notable ones that people don't realize is that the reduction of the species and the amount of number of fish that are fed actual diets has increased greatly over the last 20 years. And freshwater species now account for about 25, excuse me, 75% of total farm fish production in the world. This production has increased, and you can see below in the little graph, the black line represents freshwater fish. You can see how the growth of the industry and the production of freshwater fish has gone from somewhere below 20 million metric tons to over 40, so more than a double. <clears throat> this has occurred primarily, as I mentioned, because more fish are being fed prepared feeds and tilapia catfish and um, carp and other warm water species account for most of this. If you look back 20 some years ago, the production shown in yellow here of uh, these freshwater fish really exceeded the amount of feed that was used to, to raise them. They were, the fish were raised, many of them in extensive production, relying on natural food. As we went forward 10 years, you can see the green now uh, column exceeds the height of the yellow column, meaning that the amount of feed that was used has increased greatly and thereby supporting increased production. And that trend has continued to 2017, the last year for which I have data. And the disparity or the amount of feed fed has, has actually gone up even more. Uh, this is a very complicated slide here, but I, I broke down some of these, this information by species group, shrimp, salmon, marine fish, and so on, showing the production, the percentage that's on feed over the last 20 years, and um, how much feed is used per each group, and how much the percent of increase has occurred over 20 years. And with a red arrow, I want to draw your attention to the changes in carp, you can see that the production in 20 years has gone from over 6,000 to almost 14,000 uh, million metric tons, or sorry, 1,000 uh, metric tons, a kilotons. And uh, the column next to it, where my arrow is, you see the production of those fish that are now being fed prepared feed has tripled. But uh, they weren't; they haven't been the biggest group. Um, the biggest group to gain has really been the catfish. Now a 700 and some percent increase since 2017. That's enormous, uh, along with tilapia. Uh, the tilapia, the production has not been so much the increase in the use of feeds, although it has increased quite a bit, 20%, but just a tremendous increase in the numbers of fish being raised around the world. <clears throat> Marine fish has shown a very high percentage gain in, in that uh, respect, but uh, the total numbers of production are still quite low, much lower than that of freshwater fish. Um, fish meal, of course, have been the, the main protein source that was used from the last 50, 60 years. This uh, graph shows on the yellow line the annual production or the annual landings of fish sorry, that are used to make fish meal. And the little dotted lines here show the variability from year to year. But uh, the trend anyway, which is an important thing to know, is that since about 2000, the average trend has been decreasing right about there. Um, the other way we look at this, <clears throat> excuse me, is by species group and looking at how much fish meal is used in the diets of these species. It's quite low nowadays, particularly for the, the freshwater species. Uh, percentage of fish meal here <clears throat> show, showing one or two percent in these freshwater species. Higher percentages in salmonids and uh, marine fish and trout. And they're fish in fish out ratios are much higher than the other freshwater species that's mainly though due to the use of fish oil in these in these species so the trends in fish feeds the trends obviously we talked about and the whole purpose of this project is related to sustainability uh, which means alternatives to fish meal and fish oil that are uh, <clears throat> made from marine resources uh, the other trend is a more uh, more effort to to develop precise precision formulations, as we call them, where not only do we try to meet the minimum amino acid excuse me um, requirement of the fish, we also try to balance the amino acid requirement in a more um, 
a closer way to that which they require. And we're also seeing a lot more uh, um, emphasis placed on fish health and wellness, particularly the wellness and health of the GI tract and uh, how diets are affecting immune function. Consumers are concerned too. Quality and safety has always been a concern for farm fish as well as wild fish. But uh, we're seeing a more concern on the levels of fat and particularly omega-3 acids for, from some segments of the consuming population. This, of course, is related to uh, essential amino acids and human health. Um, contaminants were a problem about 15, 20 years ago, at least a perceived problem uh, among fisheries with mainly the contaminants being heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants, POPs. But those uh, concerns have, have diminished greatly with uh, more, more um, accurate monitoring and the rise of aquaculture fish where these uh, contaminants are less likely to be present. Uh, genetically modified organism concerns, this relates primarily to certain ingredients, soy uh, and corn, uh, they're produced in some parts of the world and consumer resistance against using these ingredients and feeds. And the biggest one that's changing now, which I'll talk about in a few minutes in more detail, is what we call value issues by consumers. It's consumers are becoming more interested and concerned about the sustainability of their food, uh, and particularly that refer, reflects to things like rainforest destruction and other factors. And of course, at the end of the day, the trends in fish feeds, fish feeds have to be economically viable and contribute to not only survival and rapid growth and efficient feeds for the economics of aquaculture to be, um, be uh, positive. Looking forward, um, aquaculture production is expected to double somewhere in the next um, 10 or 15 years to meet demand for seafood by human consumers. This will require feed production to double. And when we kind of ballpark or calculate how much additional ingredients will be needed over that period, over what we use now in fish feeds, it's about 20 million metric tons coming from plant protein concentrates, the ones we're all familiar with, soy, corn, wheat, barley, so on and so forth. Higher recovery and use of processing waste from seafood and aquaculture processing, uh, better utilization of land animal proteins, and developing protein sources, single cell proteins from bacterial yeast and insect meals. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go along. As we look at these alternatives, of course, they must be economically competitive with alternatives, the alternative mainly being fish meal. They must be sustainable articles of commerce, available in large quantities year-round, transportable, familiar uh, for, for people in the shipping, logistics, and, and feed mill use. Uh, and related to that, they must fit into the seed mill systems for material handling, which is more important for liquid materials sometimes. Uh, they must not affect pellet quality and thereby increase pollution from loss of pellets or uneaten food or formulations that increase fiber are indigestible uh, nitrogen or phosphorus. And as I mentioned before, these ingredients must be compatible with emerging social value. This is, again, an emerging issue. Uh, the nutritional considerations are the ones that all of us in the business are familiar with, amino acid balance, availability, palatability, and a nutritional fiber and ash that contribute to pollution. Uh, variability in quality among sources or suppliers. This is an, uh, getting to be a little bit of a challenge. And the price per unit protein, we're, that's what we're concerned about. One way to kind of look at this visually, and this is a little hard to explain, but I'll try to make it easy. Uh, if we put the amino acid balance in a what we call a spider diagram, it looks like a, a spider web, and assign a value of one for fish meal. If we look at another alternative, in this case, we're looking at soy, we can see that some amino acids in yellow here are present at higher levels than in fish meal. Um, and some are about the same down here, and some um, are absent, taurine, for example. Uh, we have excessive amounts of leucine and isoleucine, which um, are branch chain amino acids that can cause some imbalance in signaling and amino acid utilization. And then lower levels of alanine, but particularly methionine. <clears throat> and these, so in order to make these proteins work, we have to address this change. We do this in precision formulation. Uh, we're, our aim, of course, is to increase protein retention, which is the amount of protein in the diet that remains in the fish body for growth. And this is related to the profile of amino acids, but also the digestibility of each amino, amino acids in each uh, ingredient. And more importantly, and more recently, we're realizing 
Also, the synchronization of absorption. We want all these amino acids to enter the body through digestion and intestinal absorption, more or less at the same time. Fish health and wellness, we're exploring more and more functional ingredients. Those are those that are uh, ingredients that affect metabolism uh, in other ways other than nutrition to improve growth. And again, the two biggies, the big topics, GI tract health and immune function. And this is uh, just a basic list of uh, the ones we, can, we, we already use quite a bit. Uh, the, the glutens from wheat and corn, oilseed meals, so there's soy and other oilseeds, pea and beans, animal byproducts from rendering, and more importantly, and this has increased a lot in the last 10 years, fish meal from trimmings. And this, the main ones are trimmings from tuna that are um, being recovered and used in Southeast Asia, and farm salmon trimmings uh, more in North America. And nowadays, 50% of the fish meal and feeds comes from this source rather than the capture of wild fish. When we compare these ingredients, we can compare them on the, on the level of protein, uh, on the fat, lysine, but more importantly, it's two essential and most often limiting amino acids, lysine and methionine. Uh, these are ways that we can compare, and we see that lysine is lower, uh, as is my, uh, methionine, with one exception here, in all these ingredients, which presents some challenges in feed formulation. The price per ton, and these prices I got last week, April 22nd, one week ago today, uh, and this has actually changed and gone up a little bit since one week ago, but anyway, you can see that fish meal is much more expensive than all the other ingredients play on a basis of euros per ton, with the exception of wheat gluten meal. And when we price the um, cost of protein in each of these ingredients, how much of this cost, uh, it's a little over 2,000 euros um, for fish meal, and all the other ingredients actually can supply protein at a lower cost per unit protein than fish meal. Yep. Recently, I'm going to talk about single cell proteins. This main uh, leader in this realm is bacterial protein grown on methanol by methanolic bacteria. Those are the ones that grow on methane and methanol. These are easy to genetically modify to turn into functional ingredients. They have high levels of nucleic acids. But unless these functional properties are shown to be highly, very, highly valuable, it's they're, the economics of using them is lower than it should be. In other words, they're a little bit too expensive right now. Uh, distiller's yeast product is another one that is coming into production, and this is a byproduct of ethanol production in which the yeast used in ethanol production is concentrated and, and dried and sold. And lastly, microbial enhanced soy and barley products. Here, producers use solid state fermentation to use species of fungi that consume and utilize the components of the of the ingredient that fish don't utilize, mainly non-soluble carbohydrates, fiber. They turn them into and upgrade them into uh, proteins, uh, microbial proteins that are used by the, by the fish. And so that's a, there are products now in the market that are being used in that regard. Insect proteins, mainly from back soldier of soldier, excuse me, black soldier and fly larvae are really an up and coming ingredient, a lot of interest, a lot of investment. Uh, the quality of course varies with the substrate, a lot of research to show that how fatty acid profile can be enhanced or reduced by the substrate used. We have to be careful with avoid contamination with pollutants or heavy metals. Insect lipids for some reason are very prone to oxidation, so antioxidants must be added and the larvae meal must be defatted to produce dry meal to make it work. And the challenge we have right now is the economics of scaling up production. Um, so that's kind of where that part that that is. And another comparison here, looking again at fish meal and how these compare. These ingredients I just mentioned are more expensive on a price per unit protein than black soldier fly, uh, or than fish meal bacterial protein a little bit over. Black soldier fly a lot over. But that's because production is pretty low. People in industry predict that as production increases and the economics and efficiency increase, the price will come down for uh, protein from black soldier, so uh, from fly meal. Going back to fish meal, the recent past, um, let's say briefly a few words here about how fish meal has varied. There have been this El Nino events, big one in 1973, another big one in 1998. And in 2010, that have drastically reduced the amount of fish meal available in the world at those times. 
And um, I'll get back to that in a minute, but um, I'm just going to skip this. This is the wrong spot. Uh, changes in fish feed formulation. The thing to remember here is we tend to think of these changes over time as being gradual and related to research findings. But in fact, most of the changes in feed formulations tend to be abrupt, abrupt sudden, and historically they're caused by reduced anchovy landings in Peru. Uh, first big big cut that affected aquaculture was in 1973. In that case, uh, fish meal went, the price of fish meal went high, very high, and catfish feeds in the U.S., which used fish meal, replaced them with soy proteins and others, but they did so without any information on the amino acid requirement cat, of catfish, and a as a consequence, they experienced very high losses. Uh, this led to large investments, and really the, the beginning of large investments in fish nutrition research to understand and define these amino acid requirements so that formulations could be made in the future. The second was in 1998, again in El Nino. By this time, uh, fat, catfish, salmon, and trout amino acid requirements were known, so feeds could be formulated, but in Japan, problems happened again. An example was the Japanese yellowtail amino acid requirements. They were not known, so when fish meal was replaced with soy proteins and others, they experienced high losses, low growth, Partially related to taurine, but also just lack of information on how amino acid requirements and how to formulate. Third was just recently, 2007-8, when El Nino uh, was another contributing factor, but massive purchases of fish meal by China took about 30% of the fish, world fish meal off the market. This now didn't really chart, cause us any problems with catfish salmonids because we had worked out the amino acid requirements, but European sea bass and sea bream uh, experienced problems in terms of uh, reducing fish meal and ex experiencing lower growth, higher mortality, and uh, higher feed conversion ratios, all lowering the economics of producing those species. Uh, they weren't as bad as they were in earlier years with catfish because high fish meal levels were already used in these diets, uh, but they were bad. Uh, so since then, ingredient markets have been pretty stable until just a few years ago when African fever in China, African swine fever changed the whole dynamics again. So other, here's the, uh, the other events that disrupt fish feed ingredient markets. And just to emphasize again, this happens suddenly. It doesn't happen gradually, generally. Well, we all know about COVID-19, how that's reduced demand for farmed fish. But the uh, problem with African swine fever is not one that people really, um, they may know about it, but they don't quite understand <clears throat> the great impact that this had um, on um, the world market. Uh, over 50% of the swine in China were died from this disease. And this reduced demand for global fish meal, soybean meal, and corn because of lack of need for feed. Now, just in the last year, the swine population and the industry has been repopulated, production is going up, and this is now affecting demand and prices of fish feed ingredients. Uh, another weird thing that happened just recently, like a few days ago, the Chinese government decreed that swine diets will change from being corn-based mixtures. This is a political decision uh, intended to reduce dependence of China on imported feed ingredients. This just came out last week. China issued guidelines recommending reduction of corn and soybean, like I said. Uh, the guidelines are aimed at improving usage of available raw materials for China. And um, basically, these are the ingredients that they say they will use to replace corn, rapeseed, ones that they can produce locally. So other disruptions that are occurring right now, uh, land animal proteins, which have been allowed in aquifers for a little while, um, which has really helped us make low uh, fish meal fish feeds. Uh, the EU will now allow poultry meal to be used in swine feed and swine meal to be used in poultry feed. So this is going to increase prices for animal feed production or proteins and for fish producers will have to uh, compete with these uh, other uses and this will help us or hurt us rather in, uh, in making precision formulations. Then the cod situation in Brazil, products, soy products in Brazil may be banned due to illegal and also legal deforestation. This SPC pro, uh, protein concentrate will take some time to replace and uh, regulations will increase prices for these ingredients. Shows you that regulations done in the EU affect global fish feed trends. 
So just to emphasize this, feed ingredient markets are shifting now. Improved estimates of nutritional requirements of non salmonid fish species, especially uh, marine fish, is, should be a priority to avoid any future disruption and, 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 and problems making uh, precision formulations for these species. We need to see a higher level of application, and we're seeing that uh, certainly in this project too, the 4F project, of genetic and physiological approaches to evaluating ingredients. Another thing that fish nutrition researchers should uh, implement is the establishment of reference formulations for important species that we can use as benchmarks as we develop new formulations so we can see how these new formulations perform. And lastly, identify fish strains that outperform uh, conventional strains when fed sustainable formulations. This basically boils down to a genetics by environmental action, interaction and it also offers, offers the opportunity to utilize marker-based selective breeding to, for strain improvement, which we've done quite well in trout. Uh, the final priority for fish re nutrition research, one of my favorites, I thought I'd just mention it at the end, is look and explore in more detail the relationships between diet, fish strain, and microbiome. Uh, what we need to do is characterize and define what is a desirable microbial community in different important species of fish, then develop nutritional strategies to, to lead and enhance these uh, microbial communities through prebiotics and other dietary changes, leading to improve intestinal health. What this does is not only reduce the problems associated with low-grade pathogen challenges, which diverts uh, dietary energy away from growth towards fighting these pathogens, and also to better understand how the intestinal microbial microbiome in itself contributes to the nutritional needs of the fish. I believe this has a very high potential to improve fish food sustainability, and uh, I look forward to collaborating with my partners even further in the future.